What's up guys, it's Coop with CNT Designs again. Um, getting ready, I'm gonna film a couple more videos today. Um, but I was listening to a couple of different um, videos today on gun laws uh, here in the United States versus other countries. Um, what people think about gun laws in the United States. Um, And I kind of wanted to ask everybody, nothing else, just for myself. What are your beliefs? What are they founded on? Um, and I'm not just talking about God or a higher power, but what are your beliefs actually founded on? Can you back those beliefs up? So my beliefs, especially when it comes to firearms laws, is uh, you can't legislate evil away. You just, you can't do it. So I base my beliefs very simply off of as long as what I'm doing isn't unduly depriving someone else of life, liberty, or property, um, then when it comes to guns, I don't believe the government should have any say-so in what I own. Before this country was founded, free people, free men and women were always allowed to own arms um, to protect themselves. Later on, it was for not only protection of themselves, but protection for, say, a colony and then uh, for protection of a state. The Second Amendment, people get hung up on the shall not be infringed part of the Second Amendment. Um, and people try to explain it away as a militia right. Well, it mentions it's the right of the people to keep and bear arms. It doesn't say the right of the militia. It doesn't say the right of whoever the government sees fit to own arms. It just says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. At the time um, when the country was founded, people owned fully operational warships. They became privateers. Um, basically, they signed contracts with our government that was forming, and they had the right or the protections from um, that contract to go out and attack um, enemy warships. Uh, any enemy vessels that were transporting goods, um, whether it was money, spices, anything like that. They had the full-on right and protection um, of these states coming together to go out and wreak havoc with our enemies, um, England. So... When people mention the restrictions and the laws that we deal with now um, when it comes to firearms, and Joe Biden in his one of his speeches mentioned the oh you, the uh, at the time of the Second Amendment people didn't have the right to own any weapon. Um, they absolutely did. The only restrictions at the time were if you were going to act as part of the militia, they told you you had to have a certain type of firearm. Um, you had to have so many pounds of powder, so many um, balls. Uh, they mentioned, of course, you know, your powder horns, all that. That was mentioned that you had to have that to act as part of the militia. Um, there were some restrictions on where you could store um, certain things at the time because people living in towns you had a lot of black powder at the time that stuff is you know pretty volatile and you had candles for light sources um, and I don't agree with the restrictions then but they had some restrictions on it but it was never about restricting what type of gun that a private citizen could use to protect themselves or others um, looking at some of the gun laws later towns and um, 
cities put into place, I believe those were unconstitutional. Their state constitutions um, at the time, I don't think allowed them to do that. But people weren't as informed. A lot of people back then were completely illiterate. They, they had no idea what a state constitution said or what the federal constitution said. They had no idea about limiting powers um, or negative rights. Whereas some of those people at the time were a lot smarter than people these days. They just didn't know. Um, when Joe Biden mentions not everybody could own a firearm in that speech, uh, yeah, they were slaves, Joe, you freaking moron. Those were the people that couldn't own arms. Um, and there were some restrictions on felons at the time. Those restrictions could basically restrict their right to own firearms in a certain town or um, province, parish, depending on where they were at. But it wasn't the full-on restrictions that we see now where someone who commits a felony, they go to jail, um, they do their time, they do their probation, and then they are still restricted from owning arms. Even if they get out and they are, you know, completely decide to change their life, they're still restricted from owning arms. And I don't agree with that at all, not whatsoever. I seriously believe that if you commit a felony, you go to prison, um, when you are released, the state is basically saying that you are safe enough to be out in public and be a member of society. Like you ought to have your rights back. If you commit another crime with a gun, well, guess what? Your happy butt gets to go back to prison and you need to stay there until you get your head straight. If you don't get your head straight, well, you shouldn't be out. Um, you commit murder with a firearm, it is a absolute murder, especially a violent murder, um, you shouldn't get out of prison at all. You should go to prison for life. Or, in very heinous circumstances, you ought to be put to death. I've got zero problems with the death penalty. I have problems with the courts themselves. Um, with death penalty cases, there shouldn't be any question at all that the person actually committed the murders that led to them being charged with a death penalty. Um, if there's any question whatsoever, um, one, if there's questions, I don't think the person should be convicted, but, um, if there are any questions about it, the person should not get the death penalty. Um, the school shooters that we've had, uh, even though these kids are younger, well, say they're not kids necessarily, you're talking about some that are 18, uh, it's 100% sure they did the shooting. The court case they're going to go through is just a formality at that point uh, because we, uh, we do have a legal system that has to go through um, certain steps. They still have to be convicted before the government can take away their their rights, which is what we need. But those school shooters, they ought to be put to death. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, housing a person um, in a prison for very long periods of time um, like a life sentence, they're never getting out. Uh, to me, is it's almost more inhumane than putting someone to death because at least with death, there's an end to it. Um, housing someone in an extremely violent place um, where you take away... Uh, a certain amount of interaction in between human beings. Uh, that's a very brutal thing psycho psychologically. When it comes to the actual gun laws themselves, 
I believe quite simply that my wife's throwing stuff at the window. I believe quite simply that any law should be structured in a way where it doesn't deprive individuals of their rights. Um, the only time the government should be able to deprive someone of their rights is if they had broken a clear law, something like murder, something like rape, anything like that, then the government prosecutes them or they take a plea deal and then they are proven guilty of something, then the government has the right to take that person's individual liberties. It shouldn't be that this other person committed a crime, so we're going to strip liberties away from other people who had nothing to do with that crime. That's, that's just not the way a just law should work. And what we see with gun laws, most of the time, they're not stopping someone from committing a crime. They just become extra charges. Um, so when that person is caught committing that crime, they charge them with all these extra firearms related um, charges. Or in some cases, all they have to do is catch someone with a gun. To me, that's absolutely insane. There's, there shouldn't be a situation where the government can merely find you with a firearm. You haven't hurt anybody. There is no victim. Um, no one has been harmed by any actions. But just because you had a gun, the government gets to take your freedoms. That's absolutely antithetical to freedom and liberty. Yeah, I know I'm getting lost because I'm just rambling, watching these videos about this stuff. Um, you got to figure, like even a lot of the mass shootings that have happened, none of the gun laws that are being proposed are going to stop someone from doing that. Even if you took every semi-automatic firearm off the streets, I mean, the next mass shooting could happen with a bolt action gun, a pump action gun. Uh, somebody who wants to commit that amount of violence will simply change a tactic. They will engage targets at distance. Um, I'd have to look up the name of the shooter. The one in, one of the first ones that I ever heard about that was a mass shooting was a guy on a, uh, it's either a clock tower or a bell tower in Texas. You know, um, he just engaged targets at range. Um, and when you're getting shot at by a firearm that is being pretty accurate with its fire, or the person's being pretty accurate with the, the firearm itself, um, you can hold back a lot of other armed people that are trying to stop you because you're not allowing them to advance on your position. I mean, it's a tactic for the military. That's why snipers are force multipliers. Um, you can have a very well-armed group of troops um, and you can stop their advance with well-placed, accurate fire at distance. Um, that's why I think it was World War One. Um, the Germans just hated Marines because they were so good at engaging targets at range. So all of these gun laws that we're looking at, um, they're not stopping any of this. They never will. No matter what, I mean, through bans and everything else, the assault weapons ban didn't stop a single freaking gun crime. Um, and the DOJ actually had to admit that when they went back and looked at a decade of a ban, decades worth of a ban on certain firearms and certain characteristics on firearms, um, they absolutely had to admit it did nothing. That's why the law was allowed to sunset. Um, the laws for background checks, the Brady Bill, that's done nothing to stop criminals. That's why you don't see hundreds of prosecutions for uh, a felon going in to buy a gun and lying on a 4473. 
felons aren't doing that in mass. There might be one or two people in a lot of cases. Um, some people had charges that they didn't understand would prohibit them from owning firearms. So they really didn't even think they were lying on the 4473. They had something like a domestic charge. Um, Cause understand it just has to be punishable by up to a year in jail. Um, as far as a misdemeanor goes, it just has to be punishable by, doesn't mean you spend a whole year in jail. Um, with a domestic charge, you know, people are human, man. You can have a situation where a husband and a wife, uh, they go through years of not dealing with issues in their life and things blow up and they get crazy. Uh, one spouse attacks the other, the other one fights back. Um, and it's sad to say, but in a lot of cases, uh, say if it's a man and a woman, even if the woman attacks the man, um, if it's a domestic situation, the man is going to be the one that's going to go to jail. I mean, we typically are the stronger of the two. So we're going to be the ones that get hit. Um, do I always agree with that? No, but I don't agree with hitting women anyway. But um, I've seen things with people that I know personally that went sideways. Um, and it's not that they were bad people. It's not that they were violent people. They just had decades, in some cases, of issues um, that blew up. And people are human, man. Emotions run high. People aren't in the right mind space. And things can go sideways. Um, later on, those two people, hey, hell, it wasn't even weeks later. Later on, those two people um, got their crap together. They had that blow up. And that blow up led to them dealing with a bunch of issues. Neither one of them should have been barred from owning firearms. Luckily enough, you know, police didn't get involved and um, they were able to deal with those issues. Looking at some of the bills that are out, uh, if someone is an actual domestic abuser, again, these gun laws aren't going to stop them from harming their spouse or significant others. Uh, though you could take guns completely out of their hands. And if you look at murders, uh, especially in domestic situations, there are tons of other items, including hands and feet, that are used for a domestic abuser to take the life of um, a spouse or a loved one. Again, my belief is, is that the government shouldn't be able to strip you of your rights unless you are unduly depriving someone else of life, liberty, or property. Uh, if something is a crime worth you going to prison and losing your rights, there should have to be a definite, clear victim or injured party. Now, yes, that could be um, white-collar crime where you have... Uh, scam someone out of money or property again um, by that scam or that deception it wasn't a mutual agreed transaction to where even if I'm technically losing on the transaction um, say I had a thousand dollar item and the person wanted to get that item from me. Well, they talked me down to sell it for 500 half price. I still agree to that transaction knowing the complete ramifications of it. So that's fine. Now, if someone, I got that thousand dollar item and they buy it with say counterfeit bills. Well, then I've suffered an injury from that. I've lost property from that. So that person ought to be charged. That person ought to be uh, jailed 
and have to pay restitution for it. Um, the injured party needs to be compens compensated for that injury or loss. But with these firearms laws, uh, even getting starting with the 34 NFA, if I have a short barrel rifle, say I build a short barrel rifle, um, and I don't harm anybody with that short barrel rifle, there's no injured party. The government should have no interest in that. It shouldn't be a 10 year felony because say someone out there that doesn't understand these laws, um, builds a firearm and say they build a actual pistol, a gun that fits into the definition of a pistol and they don't understand they can't put a vertical foregrip on it. Um, and then they're at the range or they've got it in their vehicle, they're traveling from one place to the next. Um, they get stopped for, I don't know, not using a blinker. Officer asks if there's any firearms in the car. They go, yes, officer, I've got my pistol in the back seat. Uh, officer looks at it and says, nope, you've got a vertical foregrip on it. That is now a short barrel rifle. Um, you're going to jail, property is being confiscated. Um, you're getting charged with a felony and you are possibly going to prison and losing your rights when there was absolutely no threat to another person. There was no victim that, sh that shouldn't even, that, that whole class of crime shouldn't even exist for a law capable of taking someone's freedoms away, that law should be absolutely clear. There should have to be a victim or injured party. Um, because if not, what are we doing? We're just taking someone who built an object, built a gun, um, wasn't aware of the law and we're putting that person in prison and we're treating them like an absolute criminal when they really haven't done anything. They just had a gun that had too short of a barrel on it. And for you guys or anybody who sees this and all oh, short barrel rifles and uh, so concealable and all this crap, even with a 10 and a half inch barrel on an AR and you still got a 10 and a half inch barrel, you've got a receiver that's so long, then you have to have a buffer to you. It's not a very concealable firearm. And even if it is, even if it's a completely concealable firearm, what the hell does it matter as long as I don't injure someone else with that firearm? This stuff makes no sense when you think about things logically. Is there a lot of crime with guns in the United States? Yes, there is, without a doubt. But that's why you prosecute criminals to the fullest extent of the law. And if they are violent criminals, you put them in a place where they are no longer going to be a danger to society. You put their asses in prison. And you can do that without having to go through all these stupid ass gun laws. If they're using a gun to rob somebody, then that is a violent act and it ought to be charged as a violent act and that person ought to go to prison for a very, very long time. If someone murders someone else with a gun, that murder should put them in prison for the rest of their life. Um, we can go into the Ahmad Arbery case. You know, those guys didn't go out with the intent to kill somebody. They did absolutely act stupid. Um, if they wanted to catch this guy, if they thought he did something, they merely should have just followed the guy, videoed him, and had the police... Um, aware of their his location so the police could go in and handle that. Um, since they are ones who are charged, they have arrest powers. Um, 
But those guys, they didn't go out looking to kill somebody. Um, and they got life plus 20, um, except for one guy, one guy who participated in it, but mostly videoed it. He got life um, with the possibility of parole. And yet we have people every single day in the United States where they actually go out with a gun or a knife, whatever, with the intent to murder somebody. And these people plead down on this and they end up getting, you know, six years, five years. Some of them I've seen as low as three years. They plead it down so far. Um, it's insane. You know, we, we take people and with drug laws, drug laws are, are another whole class of laws that for the most part I do not agree with anymore. I used to um, until I looked at how these drug laws were being enforced. And you've got people that went to prison for decades and decades because they had, say, crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. Those were treated completely different. And, and I understand, I remember um, the news when the crack, so-called crack e epidemic actually kicked off. Um, all the violence that was involved in it. Um, but if you took the people who were committing the violent acts and put their asses in jail, prosecute them, put them in jail, and kept them in jail, then there was no sense in taking someone who was, say, an addict um, and putting them in prison for damn decades. That person could be way better served if we had the right facilities to actually put that person in a position in a place where they could be treated for an addiction um, and then released without prison time. And if you don't believe me that prison will not do anything to help someone with an addiction, um, people get drugs in prison. People do drugs in prison. Uh, you just about can't keep drugs out of prison. Now, could they, could they be in a treatment facility? Yes, but you, scientifically, you can look at the numbers. You do way better treating an addict than just jailing an addict. Now, if that addict, I'm going to turn a light on in a second. Uh, if that addict commits a crime, then you prosecute them for that crime. You jail them for that crime. And if their crime was motivated by the addiction, then you make sure that that person is in a position to where after they do their time, they can go to a facility and be treated for that addiction. Or there is some way to treat them for their addiction while they are in prison. But you get at the root issue by treating the addiction, not just by sticking someone in a damn warehouse where they're going to get drugs anyway. Um, in a lot of cases, it just becomes training camps where they learn how to be better drug addicts. Oh, let me turn on the light. Um... You know, jail people for actual crimes where you have actual victims. I would much rather live in a dangerous free society than in a so-called peaceful society, but you have no rights. You are pretty much a slave to the state. The state is involved in everything that you do. Um, there's a book that I listened to, uh, it's on my audible. I have to look up the name of the book, but it goes through that basically every person, whether you think you're law abiding or not, um, 
throughout your average day, you're breaking at least three laws that are um, punishable by a high misdemeanor or a felony. At least three laws a day. Um, and the, the author of the book goes through some of the things, and I can't remember some of them offhand. Um, but it's insane. It's insane that we have a criminal code in the United States that is so large and expansive that nobody can really um, quantify the amount of laws that we have. And if you're like me and that thought actually sinks into your skull, that amazes me. Um, and it terrifies me. And they want to put more laws on top of more laws, on top of more laws. Um, the more I get into some of the proposed bills right now, of course, um, Jared went over one today um, from Guns and Gadgets. Uh, the so One of the safe storage bills, and I say one of the safe storage bills because there are a few. Um, and God knows when I'll get to that because it was proposed a little later and I I still haven't made it off the first day of the 117th Congress. Um, one of them, if someone thought that you had guns that weren't safely stored, they could call the police if, and the police would come to your home and if they saw guns that were improperly stored, according to them, um, I think one was like, you could be charged with up to $2,000 or something per gun that wasn't stored properly. Um, and I can't, I'll have to look at the, the penalties on it as far as jail time. Um, but it was absolutely crazy. Um, I, the state being involved that much more in your life to where they are regulating more and more what you are doing in your own home I just, I can't get over people who actually want that, that larger level of involvement in their life from the federal government. Where are we at with personal freedom, personal responsibility? Um, my actions are my own actions. They're not um, someone else's actions. So if someone else commits a crime, someone else murders, someone else rapes, you know, if they murder someone with a gun, it's not my fault because I own guns. If some guy goes out and rapes a woman or God forbid a child, it's not my fault because I'm a guy and I have a pecker. If someone, this jackass who ran his Ford into a parade not too long back and what killed like eight people and wounded 20 something others, that's not my fault because I own a Ford truck. Um, it, I just, it frustrates me that people out there want to give up so much of their personal freedom because they don't want to be responsible for their own actions. You know, you carry a firearm like this every day um, because ultimately I'm responsible for my own safety and the safety of others around me. It's already went to the Supreme Court that police have no constitutional um, responsibility to protect you. In other words, a cop could literally sit 30 feet away from you and watch you get murdered they don't have a constitutional responsibility to defend you or protect you. Police in a lot of cases are just there to draw chalk outlines and do paperwork and then hopefully put someone in jail for a crime. And there, there are a lot of good officers out there who do do a lot to help people, who do do a lot to protect the public. Um, and there are a lot of officers out there who are nothing but statists. They're the guys that um, 
like one lady who, I think it was from New Jersey to New York, she got stuck in traffic, couldn't get to her, get to her exit. She got pulled over across the state line um, with a firearm that she legally owned in the other state. Um, instead of just the officer going, hey, okay, just make your U-turn, go back to where you were gonna go. Um, no, he arrested her, they charged her, they tried to put her in prison for a firearm that was completely legal in her state. Um, that officer is just an authoritarian. He's a little dictator. He's a statist. And I don't believe that the power of the state should overrule people's personal freedoms and liberties. And I've come about that belief, of course, through my life and through my experiences and through watching experiences of others. Um, I believe we ought to be angling for more freedoms and not less. There's no reason the state should have more influence and more power over our individual rights and liberties. The state was supposed to be limited. Their powers were supposed to be limited. There were supposed to be principles of freedom and liberty. And since, and even before the founding of this country, there are leftists, or there were leftist statists that wanted the all-powerful federal government and all-powerful state government in a lot of cases. Um, they were not people that believed in freedoms and liberties. Uh, they were people who wanted a monarchy. They wanted power and control because they thought they were the powerful people. And... The ink was not even dry on our Constitution, and they were already leftists and statists trying to subvert that Constitution. Um, the state con constitutions are actually older than our federal Constitution, um, and state constitutions were supposed to govern the actions in the, of the state governments. They were supposed to restrain the state governments. Um, and basically enshrine protections for the freedoms of people in those states. And the statists started in, even then, trying to give more power and authority to the state. Um, basically, again, they were powerful people and they wanted more control. And all of these gun laws are simply about control. They, they have nothing to do with saving lives. When you look at the laws themselves, when you read them, when you go into 18 USC United States Code and you go to chapter 44 and then you start looking at the sections of that law, there is nothing in there that is really meant to save lives. It is all about control. All right, I've been going for a while. Um, I'm going to get set up and film another video uh, over some medical stuff. So you guys be cool, um, and we'll catch you later. Peace.